time for Wednesday's hour number two on Hashtag Daily K with your host, Peter Bint. Korean dramas, movies and even lyrics. Why is the world paying attention to Korean stories? From classics to modern masterpieces, time to dig deep into the charms of Korean literature. On Check It Out with Paul. It's a Wednesday, hump day, jump day, pump day, grump day. Paul Matthews is in the studio with his delightful readings of Korean literature translated into English. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm all right. Your you know, taxi took a... a wrong turn. That's why Sherry requested Mr. Taxi. Did you Very hear that kind dedication? Of, I, did. I did like the song as well. Did you I have Sonia Shide driving you in the taxi? No, it was a rather old gentleman. <laughs> um, I don't think he was a member of Girls' Generation. <laughs> Not uh, yet, anyway. You never know. <laughs> They've disbanded. You They're not coming know. back. They're, well, that's what we said about who? Like the Backstreet Boys and Take That. And look, they came back. And then they went away again. Yeah, so you, who knows? It might be a cycle of love. If you could, random question, be in yes. any boy or girl group, because we don't want gender barriers, Yeah. what group would you like to be in from history? It could from be history. Korean Ooh. or it could be Western. Oh, there's only one group you have to be in. Oh. There's only one. Who? Can't you guess? BTS. No, no, the Beatles. Oh, they're also BTS in a way. B E A T L E S. Oh, wow. Have you been watching their stuff? I think they've got a documentary, is it, on the plus of Disney, I think. Uh, it is. Uh, no, I, I started watching it, but it's like seven hours long. Oh, my God. And goodness. I love their music, but I, I, I don't <laughs> need to see seven hours of them, you know, drinking tea and. Just behind the scenes, right? Yeah, exactly. Okie dokie. Wow. What would you do in a band, Paul? Because you're like an actor, theatrical, musical. Yeah. What's your forte? I play ukulele. Oh, really? I do. Wow. So I'm, I'm, George, I'm the George Harrison of, oh. uh, of, of Dash Dag Daily K. If we have a band. <laughs> David is actually very musical on a Monday. Yes. And Korean Only does great singing on a Tuesday. We could actually have a band. I don't know you what don't I do. You don't play anything. I could, I could do the recorder or the... The table bongos. You know, you'd be you'd be our bez if anyone's familiar with Happy Mondays. I'm not. Does that mean the guy that does nothing? Yeah, that sort of dances <laughs> in in front of the mic. <laughs> or, or what are those little shaking bell things? I could do those, or the maracas, or something like that. Maracas actually take a lot of skill. All right, maraca. I didn't want to. I shouldn't say that word on there. Uh, <laughs> let's get to today's hashtag, yes. uh, which is Tonga check. Which is perfect because we are a book segment on a we Wednesday. Are. Fairy tale books. What are some from your childhood that stand out in the mind? I love them all. I was a big fan of fairy tales. I still still am. I still read them. Oh, and I love lovely. reading fairy tales from around the world. Uh -huh. um, and I love Korean fairy tales as well. When I was a kid, uh, I did love Jack and the Beanstalk. Me too. That was like the standout one. I, as I mentioned it in hour one. I don't know if you heard. No, I didn't. I think I was read that the most often, actually, from my dad. I think it's it's a, it's a really popular one. I also like Puss in Boots. And the older I get, the mm. more I appreciate Puss in Boots. But what I want to talk about mm -hmm. is uh, there are some brilliant modern adaptations. Oh. There's uh, a, a writer back in the 1980s. Her name was Angela Carter. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wrote a book of short stories called The Bloody Chamber and Other Stories. Oh. And they're all based on old fairy tales. But they're modern and they're very adult. Brilliant. And this is not a book that you give to children. <laughs> Okay. I will tell you that. Not for Gio and Ellie. Uh, no, but they are absolutely wonderfully written and they mm. capture the darkness and the horror and the nastiness of wow. uh, fairy tales. Yeah, which one of our listeners, I think it was Ying Yin, was saying those are the original fairy tales and then they were kind of Disney-fied and, you know, made sanitary for kids. So maybe getting back to the origins as an adult. Kids love blood. They do. They do love all that gore and stuff, especially in story format. I love, and I was mentioning it earlier, like the ones that have been flipped around, like seeing it from the baddie's point of view, like Maleficent and things sure. like that. Yeah, I do. kids are a lot wiser than we give them credit for. Mm. And that's why Roald Dahl, for example, <sighs> has been one of the most popular kids' authors forever because so good. he 
never shied away from the nastiness. In fact, he reveled in the horrible yes. aunts and teachers and nasty characters and also terrible endings. If you think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, almost every single child <laughs> meets a horrible ending and ends up in the trash pile. That is very true, isn't it? Witches, that was one of my favourites from Roald Dahl. The, the, the witches. The witches. Sorry, not just general witches. <laughs> uh, any witches in today's tale? No, but we do have miracles. Oh! Because spring is here in my taxi which took a wrong turn before it took a wrong turn i saw the cherry blossoms oh have you seen are they out they are already out not all of them but uh-huh. some of them are blooming so wow. i wanted to bring you a story that makes you feel like you've been warned by the sun like you're sitting outside in a park and enjoying spring oh nice it's called miracle on cherry hill d d d gol c h i k o r i g a s a n d a Oh, that's it, a bit of a different Korean title, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's written by Hwang Sun-mi, and it's translated by c h i y o n g Kim and illustrated by Nomoko. And we get to go to a beautiful garden where an old man is forced to confront his past as well as learn to live as part of a loving community. We've got chickens, we've got children, we've got cherries, and much, much more. And we don't usually have something that's illustrated, so we're looking at the cover right now. Are there some illustrations in the book as well? Just a few. It's not okay. a picture book, but mm-hmm. um, we've, we've, we've covered this author before, Hwang s a n m i back in April 2020 with The Hen Who Dreamed She Could Fly. Mm. And just like that book, there are little illustrations interspersed yeah. in the book, and it just adds to the charm. Fantastic. Yeah, the Korean title, I guess like a rough translation would be The Head that lives in the the backyard or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I much prefer the English title. (laughs) That doesn't sound so heartwarming. Maybe talking about the old man, I suppose. So for those who didn't tune in when we talked about Hwang previously, just a little rundown. Sure. Born in 1963, she had a tough childhood. She grew up in a poor family. Uh, She was unable to pay to go to middle school. But luckily, a teacher gave her a key to the classroom. And she went there and she read and read and read and read. Amazing. And she studied and went to Seoul Institute of the Art. She went to Gwangju University, Jungang University. And she's published more than 40 books. Uh, She's much loved here in Korea. She's won lots of awards. She writes for both adults and children. Mm. And uh, there are three books available in English so far, as far as I know. One we've covered, The Hen Who Dreamed She Could Fly. This one and The Dog Who Dared to Dream, which, in fact, I bought this morning. on a very popular river-based uh, internet <laughs> site. And it only cost me uh, $2.41, I think. Wow. They were having some sort of sale, it seems. Impressive. So her books are very reasonably priced in certain places. All right. A great tip for you guys. We do sometimes do texts that are free to access yes. as well, and we'll let you know about that. That's not the case for today's story. Uh, no, 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 no. I no, bought this book fair and square. Okay. And the translator, we featured j i y o n g a lot. Right? Yes, we featured her just a couple of weeks ago with her brilliant translation of The Investigation. Uh, it would take too long to name all the <laughs> books that we've done of hers, but she's one of our regular translators. Uh, she's brilliant. She's a lawyer who translated as a hobby and mm. then just basically became a full time translator because she was, I don't know, loving it, enjoying it. She's translated over a dozen books from Korean to English, and if you see her name on the cover, you know you're going to get a solid translation. I don't know why, but Nomoko sounds familiar. We haven't done this illustrator in the past. Yes, we we? have. Oh, that's why it sounds familiar. Yeah, we did it back in April 2020 when we did The Hen Who Dreamed She Could Fly. You told me that just earlier, didn't you? And I wasn't even listening. I do apologise. Yes. So (laughs) Nomoko is the pen name for Kazuko Nomoto. She's a Japanese designer and illustrator. She's based in London and she's had exhibitions all around the world. And yes, for the three English translated books of Hwang Sun Mi, she is the illustrator. Oh. That's nice to have for those translations. Uh, Let's get into things then. Where do we start in the story? We're going to start with the old man in the garden talking to himself. Kang Desu, he said to himself, closing his eyes. Aren't you famous for being level-headed and calm? Sir Lump, don't be so thrilled about this. I'm fine. Tears trickled down his cheeks. He raised his fingers to his temples and grimaced at the wetness. Pitying me now, are you? He hadn't expected that he still had the capacity to cry. Fascinating. Or maybe it was time to be concerned. 
Sir Lump was the tumour that had been growing in his brain for some time. The tumour had brought him here. When he found out, he couldn't accept the diagnosis. This tumour had settled in his brain without permission. He didn't want to crack his skull open to scrape it out. What if he lost his battle with this invasive intruder? This malicious growth had staked out a very sensitive part at the back of his brain, and he would just have to live with it, coaxing it along, just like Dr. Kim said. There wasn't really any other option. How dare Sir Lump pity him? He heard something coasting along with the wind. Something like humming. Kang remained on his back. If he concerned himself with every singing animal or person who was evidently trespassing on his property, the tumour would swell and burst from sheer irritation. If Kang had raised his head just a little bit, he would have spotted a white-haired woman with a basket opening the front gates to his property, as if entering her own house and walking past the grapevines. He would have seen her walk through the sweet briar thicket but he was on the ground and didn't notice her at all. We have some messages. Sherry Osborne saying, I saw all of the author's books have a very similar cover. They do. They're oh. wonderful. Interesting anthropomorphism, giving his tumour a name and personality to feel like he has a bit of control over what happens. Yes. It does remind me a little bit of the story that we did with the AIDS patient giving AIDS a name. Yeah, Kylie. And that was, that was like mind-blowing at the time. And so today seeing it again, I think that's kind of an interesting... And I would like to think I might use that way if, God forbid, that ever happened to me. You know, you're living with some kind of looming, devastating condition, giving it a fun little name and just having a little conversation with it. Tropic Girl says, what was he doing on the ground? Lying down, watching the clouds? Who was the white-haired woman? An old flame, a relative he no longer recognises due to the tumour? And yeah, I don't know if it mentioned it at the beginning of the reading, but I found myself suddenly thinking, oh, he's lying down. Because when you started, I was just picturing him standing outside or something mm. like that. That was a kind of interesting turn of events, I it feel. It was. Mm. Does that mean it has some kind of significance? We do know that this seems to be a terminal tumour, which is not going to be operated on. So is he dying or is he... Potentially able to live with it, it kind of said in there. Dr. Kim was saying just coax it along. Yeah, well, that's the thing. He's His prognosis is not good long term. Mm. You know, he's got this brain tumour. He's trying to keep it under control, but he's not going to have an operation. So he's, he's just sort of <coughs> living his life as best he can. Okay. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very odd situation. Um, so he's just recently arrived on Cherry Hill. Mm -hmm. Now... This place used to be a big neighbourhood, but he bought the land a long time ago uh -huh. and has left it all empty apart from this one house. Okay. So he owns all the surrounding land. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't moved in until now. Yeah. But this has been his plan. And because he had to retire, thanks to Sir Lump, not Sir Loin, uh -huh. I should point out, <laughs> he's decided to settle here. Okay. But he gets annoyed with the house and the grounds. In fact, oh. the reason he's lying on the ground is because he's kicked some branches in frustration. Oh, no. And he's cut himself and hurt himself. Oh, dear. Yeah. And it's a noisy place. There's a cockerel that crows every morning. <laughs> okay. There's chickens running about. There's a young girl called Yuri who visits with her puppy and collects any eggs that have been laid. Oh, she just helps herself to them. Yeah. And there's this mysterious woman who's walking in mm. so he decides to seal off the grounds he doesn't mm. want intruders getting in yeah. he also wants to get rid of the cockerel Ugh. he's really a big grump basically okay. a grumpy grumpy grump grump and he doesn't want his peace disturbed okay reasonable maybe and he's got a he's got a list of things he wants to do and he decides i'm going to learn a musical instrument oh nice never learnt one before mm -hmm. um and he picks up a guitar. He's got okay. no talent for it, but he's like, I'm going to do this. We, we know that he's an old fella. He is. Story. He's a very okay. old fella. And his personal assistant, Park, attends to his every need, sort of comes by every morning, cooks food for him, does everything. But Kang is not nice to him. He oh, treats dear. him really <laughs> unkindly. Okay. And he also treats everyone else unkindly, like the owner of the local shop, Jang, and mm -hmm. the local kids who are hanging around. And there's two in particular. There's Pierre who's um, a multicultural kid. Oh, nice. Uh, his dad's from France, his mum's from Korea, okay. and his friend Sang-hun. Uh -huh. 
And as we read, we learn that actually Kang used to live at Cherry Hill when he was a kid. Oh, interesting. Not in the house, Uh but in a shed in the grounds. Oh, so he's from poorer backgrounds. Yeah, his father worked at the house. And in Uh fact, his father died when he was trying to fix a swing and it fell on him. Oh, no. And so Kang was sent abroad at the age of 10 Uh and was adopted by a family. And now he's back to sort of claim the house and claim the grounds and... Well, sort of have his revenge, because he was never allowed inside the house when he was a kid. Wow, what an interesting history. Yeah, and the more he's there, the less grumpy he starts to get. He sort of gives up on killing the cockerel. Great. (laughs) Um, And he goes for walks. Mm -hmm. And Cherry Hill is actually a beautiful natural place. There's rabbits, there's frogs, there's ponds, life is abundant. Mm. And one day he takes a long hike, far longer than he expected, ends up on the top of the hill, exhausted, and meets a Frenchman, who's actually the father of Pierre. Okay. And they have a chat. He doesn't reveal that he's the landowner. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jean is really worried because he's got a teacher for a day event. And I don't know. Have you ever done this? Uh, no. Going into like a school. Yeah. This, this is where the parent comes in for the day to okay. basically teach kids about their job. Nice. Um, and Sanghun, Pierre's friend, has said that Jean is an architect. Uh-huh. He's not. He's actually just an English teacher. Oh, dear. <laughs> and he doesn't want to let his son down. Aww. And then after their conversation, Jean very kindly helps Kang down the hill because he's exhausted. Mm-hmm. And he shows really great kindness. That's nice. And so Kang's like, well, maybe I can help him. Oh, how? And so you feel like Kang is getting used to Cherry Hill. Mm. Getting used to the little girl, Yuri, and her dog visiting. It's almost like he's mellowing, softening as the days go by. Oh, it's kind of like a bar humbug turns into nice old gentleman theme. So far, let's get to our second reading. When Yuri spotted him, she greeted him with a curtsy. She wasn't even wary of him anymore. She came up to him as though she were about to tell tales on someone. Grandpa Giant! She cried. Kang swallowed hard. Her puppy kept barking at him. Why do you call me Giant? Kang asked. Yuri pouted. "Uh, Because you live in such a big house, that's why. Kang nodded at the very simple reason. Grandpa Giant, I don't see cutie. I bet Meanie ate her. He's so mean. All he does is bother the hens. That's what he does all the time. Kang was baffled. What was he supposed to do when a child went on like this? Who was cutie? Who was Meanie? Was cutie a chicken? Could Meanie be a cat? It seemed sensible the cat would eat a chicken. Was that what happened? You named a chicken and a cat? Why? Yuri just blinked at him. Then again, he did ask too many questions all at once. Finally, she explained. Why not? Everyone needs a name. I'm Joe Yudi, your Grandpa Giant. This is Walnut Tree. The cockerel is chief and the bunny is scaredy and the cat is meanie. Hey, bad cat! Yuri suddenly shrieked, startling the old man. I'm not in school yet, so I didn't get to buy a chicken in front of the school. I'm going to buy one next year. Meals got the one who's got chief. And Sangham bought Troublemaker and Baby. He had more, but they died when they were chicks. All because of Minnie. Pierre got Spotty and Dotty and Cutie to hatch it. First they were eggs, but then they made them so warm they turned into chicks. But then Minnie got them back at! You're going to be in big trouble! Kang shook his head. He felt short of breath just listening to her clear, bright voice chirping away without pausing. He couldn't even understand everything she was saying. Though it was fascinating to observe her facial expressions... What he could deduce was that each of the chickens had an owner, one of the many children who came and went as they pleased. They bought them in front of their school, or hatched them from the eggs. Although, who knew if it was even possible to incubate eggs at home? In any case, they let them loose on his property and came by every morning to collect the eggs. How brazen! Okay, so he's mellowing, it seems. He's warming up to being there. But he's very confused about a child's point of view. It doesn't seem like Kang has much experience with little kids, perhaps. Does he then take kindly to them, welcome them all in, live together, perhaps? No, 
No. No, he makes his mi- up his mind he's going to stop everyone from coming in. Oh, onto his property. Yeah. That's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> so he, despite him feeling better about himself, he's like, no, no, I'm still going to shut everyone out. Oh. And he even gets the maintenance company to start protecting his fences and walls better. Wow. But before that happens... Mm-hmm. He meets this white-haired woman oh, that we heard returns. about in the, in the first excerpt. Yes. Uh-huh. So he discovers a perfectly kept vegetable patch. And she's actually the one who's tending to it. Oh, as if it's her own land. Yeah. <laughs> and so she acts really strangely. She's softly spoken, but it feels like she thinks she owns the place. Uh-huh. She's even got a key for the gate she uses to enter the grounds. Oh, that's another level. Yeah. So the maintenance company, they shut everything down, seal off the entryways. They put warning notices up. No one's going to come in. But now the cats start eating the eggs and attacking the chickens. Oh, no. And the perfect garden starts going to seed. And then one of the eggs has hatched and he feels responsible for the newly born chick because the mother seems to be missing. Uh Uh-oh. So he has to take care of it. (laughs) And then the maintenance man comes back and starts talking to him really honestly about how important Cherry Hill is to the neighbourhood and whether he might change his mind about letting people use the land. That would be nice. And he's thinking about it, and he's really conflicted. He's Mm. sort of going this way, that way, this way, that way. And then the next day, he even volunteers to go to Pierre's school, (gasps) and he gives a presentation with Jean. Because he used to be an architect himself. Oh, that's how he can help. Okay. Yeah, so he speaks in English. And in French, and Jean translates into Korean. Mm. And the kids are amazed, because they're going three languages, this way, that way, this way, (laughs) talking about architecture and how to build houses. Mm. So everyone's impressed. But Sanghun, the other kid, Pierre's friend, seems really upset. Why is that? Well, like he's being left out. So, little by little, despite him not letting anyone in to the garden, Mm. the community are letting him into their hearts. Oh, and he's helped by the neighbourhood, by Jang's, the uh, shop owner's granddaughter, Miho, mm-hmm. by Yuri's mother and by others. And he, he starts to open up a little bit. He lets Yuri and only Yuri back into the garden to scare the cats away uh-huh. and take care of the chickens. Okay. And then Yuri's mother has a favour to ask him because Yuri's mother's mother is the white-haired woman. Ah. And she has Alzheimer's. Oh. And visiting the garden is the one thing that makes her feel good and helps her mind because you see she used to live in the house <gasps> she was the owner or the lady of the house she was the daughter oh. of the owner of the house her oh. name is han songgi or han songji it's difficult to tell with the english translation mm-hmm. and she's the girl that kang loved as a child his father worked for her father oh he had a crush on her uh, well yeah it's a friendship they okay. were very young you know we're talking about six seven years okay. old <laughs> And we learn how he was bullied as a kid, how he felt isolated. We learn that actually Jang, the store owner, was one of the kids that used to bully him. Uh Uh-oh. But he's changed. He's become a much better human being. And so Kang has to confront his past. And he also realises he needs to help Sang-hun, who's actually Yuri's older brother. Oh. Because he sees himself in Sang-hun. He realises they they are a kindred spirit, as it were. And he also learns that uh, Songyi and her family... They actually did their best to help him when his father died. He finds out the truth about the situation and his heart is starting to heal. And so he lets Songyi back into the garden and even into the house itself. Oh, it seems like it might be a happy ending. Are you ready? Every day is K-pop. Listen up. Anytime and everywhere. Adidas Radio. Adidas Radio. Kang watched quietly as Songi and Yuri walked towards him with a basket of cherries. It was as if Songi, past and present, were walking side by side. They looked so similar, even though he hadn't noticed that when he first met Yuri and hadn't even recognized Songi. Was that the power of time? Just as Jiang was present in Miho, nothing completely disappeared. Tears of loneliness sprang to Kang's eyes. He had achieved so much, but he didn't know what to do with this emptiness. It made him feel as though something had slipped through his fingers. Dementia made people tragic, ruining the patient and their family. It was a disease that made you question why people existed at all, but here, they were joyful as they accepted an old woman who had lost her mind. He was sure there were difficulties, 
hardships he couldn't begin to fathom. Dr. Kim had once compared his illness to dementia in an effort to make him feel better, saying, Isn't it better than dying without any awareness of who you are? Kang touched Sir Lump and thought of the inev inevitability of endings. Kang met Songi and Yuri and took the heavy basket from them. If Songi could smile despite this disease, he certainly could too. If his friend was experiencing time this way, all he could do was to accept it. He couldn't do anything else about it, just like he couldn't do anything about the lump growing in his brain. Thank you, Songi said. She clearly didn't know who he was. Where was she in her past? It is kind of, in a subtle way, very touching for the spring weather, Paul. I like it. Is this how it ends? Is there more to come from Kang opening up even more to other people? There is a little bit more. Oh, is there a love story with Songy? Well, no, there can't be a love story because they're living in two different times. Uh -huh. But there is a friendship there. And Kang is able to make Songy comfortable. Okay. And he actually, he finds a letter in a wardrobe in the attic that she wrote to him when she was 15 that was returned to sender. Oh, wow. She tried to get in touch. Yeah, because she cared about him. Uh-huh. And there's also a photo of him and his father that he's never seen before. Amazing. Yeah, and so he decides to get rid of the shed where he used to live, which is all broken down. Mm -hmm. and he cleans up the garden. And inside the shed is his father's old chair. Oh, wow. It survived all these years. It can't be used as a chair, but mm. maybe it could be turned into a swing. A swing that, that killed his father. We almost go in full circle. Yeah, oh, and wow. so the book ends with Songi sitting on this new swing. And somehow she recognises Kang Dae Su. Oh. She calls his name and asks him to sit with her. And they're living at different times. <gasps> She's in the past and he's in the present. But their friendship is strong enough to keep them together. Oh, that's so sweet. Even if it's just a fleeting moment, which often it is with dementia, yeah. she recognises him again. Exactly. So we've got oh. two people nearing the end of their lives, but they're able to connect mm. in, a, in a very odd, a very unusual way. And it's, it's, it's a really lovely, touching ending. And then after that, there's an author's note. Oh, And I okay. wanted to talk about the author's note because I thought that was really interesting too. Yeah. Huang explains how she wrote the book. She, she went to Vienna in Austria mm -hmm. and she wrote it uh, over a period of a few months, just okay. a few weeks, staying inside a hotel room. She was feeling lonely, just like Kang, as she created Cherry Hill in her mind. Oh, a bit personal. Yeah, and then one day she went walking and she saw a chair under a large tree and that chair reminded her of her father's chair in the yard of her old home. Oh, okay. And after he died, mm. she went back to his house mm. and the chair was there. Ah. And this was the chair he sat in to wait for his children oh. to arrive or where he would trim the vegetables. Oh. And it had been a desk chair for each of his five children where they were studying his kids. OK. And then they, after they finished using it, it became his chair. Oh. And when she looked at that chair after his death, she was able to imagine him in it oh. looking happy and at rest. And it's that sense of time heals wounds. And that's what this book is all about. It's about a little boy who lost his father, who felt isolated, alienated, hurt and upset. And as an old man, that old man was able to cure, to heal the little boy's wounds. Oh, that is lovely. And Hey It's Renz also says it's so pretty as to how the story naturally progresses through the process of healing. That's what we're encapsulating here. And yet having some physical object which may seem useless and meaningless for us, we've also got my dad's armchair. We've brought that over to Korea as well. Yeah. And when my kids sit in that, I don't know. Like Ellie never even met her grandpa, but it's like they're connected in some way. She loves that chair for no particular reason. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's the wonderful thing because... It, he he remains in their lives mm. through that chair. And, yeah. and, you know, as you said, even though she may not have met him, she has that beautiful connection. And so 
Yeah, it's a really lovely story. It's a perfect story for spring. Mm. So if you want to feel a little bit happy, but also maybe get a little tear in your eye, <laughs> Miracle on Cherry Hill is the book for you. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul, for your beautiful readings. Uh, thanks to you and everyone. Thanks, as always, to the Literature Translation Institute of Korea for their help with copyright permission for this broadcast. Thank you to Hwang San Mi for her lovely book and Chiang Kim for her translation. Next week, the book I will be reading for you is Mina by Kim Sagwa. It's translated by Bruce and Ju Chan Fulton, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. I'll see you next week. See you then. You can listen to Check It Out with Paul Matthews on Adidang Radio's Hashtag Daily K every Wednesday from 10am KST. 